onto Warbirds, brought to you by the Tri-State <coughs> Warbirds Museum in Claremont County. Presenter is Pat Giblin. He is a U.S. military veteran. He is a volunteer at the Tri-State Warbirds Museum. He is a retired police officer. And uh, many years ago, I worked for his father, who was also a police sergeant. So uh, I've been so excited about this since Pat agreed to this. I grew up just idolizing these aircraft, and now we're going to learn a lot more about them. Okay. Pat Giblin. Wait, I, I've been preempted. Here, act like you know what you're doing. Well, I guess I can I can start. My name's Pat Giblin. I'm a I'm a veteran. I think he, he gave all my uh, my feelings. As soon as he's finished, I'll, I'll grab the mic. I don't want to. Well, I'm push him out of the way. Oh, no, I can't. He's, he's in charge of technology. He knows more about this than I do. And you can see I'm doing a great job with it. So far, so good. Except I can't get this off the screen. Just hit it. Just kick it in the right that's spot. What, that's what I always do. So I've been bonding. It's showing on the big screen. Somehow. So push push the push button. Oh, there we go. Here we go. They say I can't be taught. <laughs> how many how many veterans are in the room? So, how many how many aviation and warbird enthusiasts are out there? People who love and warbirds technically are typically as uh, described World War II era and early Cold War era aircraft, and we have a number of them. With the exception of one of the warbirds that I'll show here, every one that I'll be talking about does fly. They've been restored to flying condition. Okay, I was afraid, I didn't want to, uh... oh, is that better? No, oh, okay, good. I, I keep hearing an echo, but that's okay. So. Rather than me have you wait for questions until the end, if you have a question, go ahead and raise your hand as we go through this. Um, we have 11 planes to talk about, and I've got a few slides per plane. Thank you. And how many pilots are out there? Any, anyone a pilot? Neither am I. <laughs> I. I jumped out of them when I was in the military and just never got around to learning how to fly. But this is the uh, exterior, the, the side that we see when we uh, enter from the parking lot of the Warbird Museum. And it is out at Claremont County Airport. But don't go to Claremont County Airport where Sporties is because you'll be on the wrong side of the tarmac from, from it. And can I, because this is a video. This is about a 30 second video within the PowerPoint. I'm not sure how to get it rolling. Push the center button. All right. If that works. Dial that. Nah, it may not work. But this is a view of one of the hangars. We have two hangars. The, the museum began in 2000. The idea began in 2003. And they broke ground in 04. We originally opened with a single hangar. Uh, of about 5,000 feet, 5,000 square foot hangar, actually, yes. And with a space, several thousand more square feet of where the entrance is, there's uh, a setup of World War II aviation, like air crews barracks, and we have, a, we have a library, we have other, all kinds of books, People bring in artifacts and things from, from their family history that have to do with military aviation. So this is just one of our hangars. We're now up to, uh, we've got two hangars that have a total of 22,000 square feet of museum space and 
in between the two hangars, we have uh, a shop area where our restorers work to bring these aircraft up to flying capability. This first one here, this is, a, well, they call it a flit fire, kind of a, a pun, because it was mocked up to look like, to be painted up like a uh, super, super marine spitfire. These were originally, there were 48 of them that were built and flown to LaGuardia in New York to uh, before Pearl Harbor to raise money for the British military. Uh, you know, America had, was pretty isolationist back then, but there was a strong feeling that we were gonna get involved in, in the war, at least in Europe, before too long. So this is actually basically a Piper Cub and it is a pretty small plane. Uh, this, this one was built after World War II. This was built in 1947, and over the last nearly 70 years, it's had four engines, six propellers, and about 20 different owners. Wow. Yeah, and it, a museum volunteer named uh, Dennis Stewart bought this as a pretty much a wreck and worked with a group of restorers to get it airworthy, and he, then he donated, donated it to the museum in memory of his father, who was uh, uh, air crew in World War II in the U.S. Army Air Corps. And that's it in, in its outdoor setting there. And <coughs> Piper Cub, this, this plane manages about a whopping 90 miles an hour, top speed. Uh, it is mostly fabric, and it's a, a tandem style. So because of the center of gravity of the aircraft, if someone's flying in this solo, they sit in the back seat. Because the engine has most of the weight, and if they sit up front, it will tip over before it takes off. That, yeah. But the, the beautiful thing about, let me go back. The beautiful thing about fabric in aircraft were versus metal is when fabric got shot full of holes when they landed, uh, the air crews just threw tape over them. And then it could be airworthy again. Whereas with metal, you know, rounds going through might leave gaping holes. But this doesn't have any of the armor that typical combat planes had. Uh, and they were made to fly low and slow to be forward observers. Sometimes military commanders would go up in them to get a bird's eye view of a battle area. And they were also spotters for artillery and sometimes they could mark targets for uh, fast movers, for the fighter bombers doing attacks. And there, were, there was one pilot who got tired of, can't remember his name, but he got tired of just being able to watch, just having to watch things go on. So he had one of the armors in his squadron hook up like two or three bazookas to the, to the uh, struts on either side and had it wired so that he could shoot and become a, an attack point. So he would, he would find German positions that were hidden, light armor, and fire at them. And of course, other pilots wanted to do that, and then their, their commander caught them and made them take them off and get back to the job they were supposed to be doing. Like, you know, leave the shooting to the, the fighter bombers and go look for stuff for them to shoot up. And then, also, I want to mention that the way I built this presentation tonight is to take you from the first type of aircraft an aviator would get into, military aviator would get into, all the way up to the much more advanced type. So this, this was also, in, in the civilian world, was also the way that a lot of pilots, including Neil Armstrong, discovered aviation as a teenager in a Piper Cub. And he was at also, actually at the grand opening of the museum. And I was not there, and I'm bummed because he was one of my heroes. <coughs> this is the, uh, no, yes sir? Just quick question on that last one. If it flew at 90 miles an hour, what altitude? Do you have any idea? Probably no more than about three or 4,000 feet. Okay. Because they, 
after 10 or 11,000 feet, crews have to have O2 or they're in danger of passing out. And it gets really cold up there too. Um, it's every 1,000 feet is five degrees cooler than the ground temperature. So the B-17s at, at 35,000 or 32,000 feet, it's minus 65 up there. So they much colder than uh, what he would deal with, except maybe in the winter. And these were also great medevac vehicles. Believe it or not, they could, they had modified ones, the L4s and the L5s, that had it on the right side, had a larger door that opened up and they could put one stretcher in. And these are really short takeoff. I mean, they could get off, off the ground about 150 to 200 feet because they are so light. This, the PT stands for primary trainer. So primary trainer is one that, now, now we've got more horsepower. This has got a seven cylinder radio engine, got a couple hundred horsepower to it. Probably top speed of 200 miles an hour. It's fully aerobatic, uh, but it has fixed landing gear and it does not have flaps. So. They wanted, to, they wanted to get combat pilots trained up as quickly as possible, but they didn't want to overwhelm them. So if the pilots who survived the, uh, the L-4, AKA Piper, this was their next aircraft that they got into. And again, this is one where the pilot sits in the rear seat. If you have two people, then the instructor pilot could sit in front or sit in the rear. I think a lot of the instructor pilots sat in the rear so they could smack their cadet in the back of the head because you can just about reach as long as the slipstream is not too much and has dual controls. So occupant in the front or the rear has the minimal gauges that it has. They have rudder pedals and they have their the stick for the ailerons. And as I was saying about the, the fixed landing gear was on purpose because now this is a fully aerobatic plane so they're learning different characteristics of flight. They're taking it at more extreme regimes but they didn't want to overwhelm students with uh, having to remember the landing gear. So this way if they landing gear wasn't even in their on their mind they wouldn't belly in because they had the, the wheels there that were f and the gear that was fixed. Once they, uh, and that's of course an overhead shot in Hangar 1, and if you look at the, the red dot in the star there, they, they referred to that as the meatball. And that was basically, those were the markings for the United States until shortly after Pearl Harbor because what was happening was ground gunners were shooting at anything, especially in the Pacific, anything that had a red ball shape, they figure it was Japanese and if it wasn't, you can't go wrong shooting it. So they ended up getting rid of the meatball because there were some friendly fire casualties at Pearl Harbor which I can totally understand. I was jumped on. I, I'd want to shoot at anything too. This is outside of the museum, so the, uh, the first slide that showed the brick coming around, this is where the hangar door is open and that faces the, the uh, tarmac for Claremont County Airport. So we have our own taxiway that goes out and then we go further down to I believe that's the west? No, it's east. And then they take off typically into the wind. And I was wrong about my transition. This is an this, the C-45 or TC-45. The T stands for training. This is the expediter. Uh, this one is Pokey Pokey is the name of this one. And this was an, ex an executive transport for military officers. And it's basically a Beechcraft Beach 18 that was converted for military use. And the particular one here, one of the reasons why we have the planes that we do because 
Some of these planes are about 80 years old. The only reason why they survived is with one exception, they were not in combat. Uh, the ones that were in combat were so beat up and shot up, and at the end of World War II, a lot of them were carrier-based propeller planes. A lot of them, they stripped them of their weapons and fuel and dumped them in the ocean because they were going to jets and they thought they didn't need propeller aircraft anymore. But this was also a great trainer for pilots who were going to go to multi-engine planes. Uh, B-25, the B-17 Flying Fortress, any of those. And this one is, you could do aerobatics in this, but it would probably not be real pleasant for the passengers, but they are capable. And that's retractable landing gear, uh, super stable because of the configuration of the tail with the two vertical surfaces there. And that is a picture from Claremont County Airport with, with uh, Hokey Pokey taking off. And that's just sitting by the hangar. This, this is the AT-6 Texan A stands for advanced. So if a pilot survived the cadet slash steerman, also called, the, the Navy called it the N2S, the steerman, which was known as the yellow peril when they mocked it up in <coughs> navy yellow. This one, the AT-6, has flaps, ailerons, retractable landing gear. So, and pilot, and instructor pilot. This was the one if they belt if a student bellied this in, meaning they didn't they didn't drop the landing gear, they found them another uh, assignment. They were no longer going to be pilots because when you got to this point, this this again is a fully aerobatic. This one is a little bit of history about this one because th this was. Built by North American Aviation. Also, North American built the P-51 Mustang, which we'll get to in a little bit. And this one was uh, delivered to the Army Air Force in May of 1944, and it stayed stateside. Uh, it was stationed at bases all around on the continental United States, never made it overseas. And in 1953, it was declared surplus and sold off. And this this one actually had it had over nearly 5,100 hours of flight time when it was sold. It was passed through several owners. One gentleman bought it, had it restored to uh, current condition, and over a period of a decade, which is not unheard of for the current state of restoring warbirds. You know, back, back in the 1940s when the assembly lines were going full blast, they were turning out, even the, the B-24 bombers at the Willow Run plant in Michigan, they were turning out one every hour wow. by 1944. Wow. And, but, after the war, those planes were, you know, they were fairly obsolete by the end of, in, in a four-year period. And they got rid of the, a lot of the tools, a lot of the machines, got rid of a lot of the planes. Many of them were sold for scrap. Uh, this one, happily, was sold to the Warburg Museum, and it's maintained by, by our folks who are all, they're volunteers who have, I've talked to a couple of them. They're very no nonsense, and they've got like, their whole careers have been. Um, they're AMP certified, meaning airframe and propulsion. So most of them are pilots. Since they were teenagers, they've been around planes, and they come into the shop and work on them. And we just, when we're bringing folks through the museum, we just stay out of their way. <laughs> yes, sir. I think the. Uh... Confederate Air Force has one of those, and I think they go around, and um, I flew one of those up in uh, Connorsville, Indiana. Nice. Okay? And it was it was really slick. Now, they they, they get you up, okay, um, but they, you know, it's a dual control. Uh, I sat in the front, the, uh, the pilot was in the back, 
and the dual control to when he would use it either the stick or the ailerons and stuff. And what he was doing, it would happen the same up in my kitchen, okay? And so, uh, you know, I read the book on it before we went and stuff, and we got up and says, okay, take me 45 hard feet, so I knew what the altimeter was, and we got up, and um, then he said, you want to do some uh, aerobatics? And I said, heck yeah, you know. <laughs> and so he says, okay, we'll do a, we'll do a roll, and you know, he, he, he does it, and you get the stick and throw it to the left, and put down your aileron, and you, you get one of those. He says, okay, you know how to do that? Said, yep. So, Nice. I did it, and then uh, did a, uh, a loop, and then, uh, like that, to get the, the stick and just throw it down, and the plane goes down like that, and then you just yank it back, and it goes all the way around it like that. It was really slick. If uh, anybody gets an opportunity to uh, run one of those. That would be fun. It's pretty slick. Yes, sir. What did I call an SNJ in the Navy? That was, you know what, you are correct. That was the SNJ. Because didn't they use the same body to make Tor, Tor, Tor? They made them in the air. They did. What, um, there were, for understandable reasons, there weren't too many uh, Japanese Zero fighters at the end of the war. And uh, so they did. They turned the 18... If you've seen the original Tor, Tor, Tor and a lot of World War II movies that deal with the Pacific, they put a little bit of... Uh, cosmetic work into these and they, they make them kind of sort of look like zeros. But they don't. And this one, as as with all the warbirds, you know, now we have the aircraft, they have fly-by-wire where the, the pilot, there's no direct input to the control surfaces by the pilot. Pilot will move the control surfaces and then it goes to a computer that decides what can be done. But these are all direct input, and when they say fly-by-wire, it's fly-by-cable. There's very little that's hydraulic in here, so they really, and the faster they go, the more the slipstream goes over the control surfaces and it makes it harder to maneuver, so um, they gotta work out, especially in, in the bigger, the, the B-17s, B-24s, you know, there's some of those pilots were flying eight to 10 hours. Yes, what you were saying, they used to call them the Confederate Air Force, and for various reasons, about 20 years ago, they changed it to the Commemorative Air Force. Right. But they, uh, they have some really amazing planes. They, they also have one of two uh, flying B-29s left in the world. I don't think we have enough space for that, because that's a 141-foot wingspan on, on a B-29. And now we're going to get into, well, this was when it was having repairs done before the engine came. And this one has a, has a radio engine, which means that the cylinders are arranged all around the propeller. And if you look at the mounts, it's got to be a pretty substantial network of tubing that bolts up to the firewall and then the engine bolts on to the motor mount. And it's uh, powerful. They're bigger than you think they are when you get close to them. I, I've had the pleasure one time. I never know what's going to happen on some days when I go and volunteer because we, we're about to show up on any of the two days that the museum was open and for special events. So one of the days I showed up was an open cockpit day. So I got to climb in. And, it was really cool. But it uh, takes a little bit of jockeying around to get yourself in, into it. And here it is out in front of Hangar 1. Now, the P-40 Kitty Hawk. This one is uh, a P-40M. These were considered obsolete when they first came out. But it was... Uh, you know, by the time the war started, these planes had been designed in the mid-30s, and uh, they did not have the speed or the maneuverability of the, the Japanese Zeros, but what they did have was self-sealing fuel tanks and an, a half-inch thick armor plate behind the pilot, and they were very durable. 
and had six 50 caliber machine guns. This one is mocked up to uh, look like one of the pilots from the Royal New Zealand Air Force. And he was a, a double ace, he had 11 victories. But this plane, the history of this plane and, and how it looks, you owe it to yourself to get out to the museum when you can because there are no barriers. There are no, you can walk right up to these aircraft and gently touch them. Just don't move the control surface. But I'll show you what this looked like in 1962. It was damaged, it was lend leased to the Royal New Zealand Air Force and during a training landing, it, it uh, had a hard landing, broke a wheel, or broke the whole landing gears on one side. They pushed it off the runway, and when the unit moved on, they just wrote it off as lost. And it was, somebody came along, bought it, used a blowtorch to cut the wings off, and they were gonna sell it for scrap. And that's what it looked like in 1962. Oh, it's, to see what they were able to do with it over the years, because this, uh, it was bought from a scrapyard by a gentleman down in, I believe in Australia, and placed in storage until 05. The Warburg Museum bought it in 06, had it shipped back, shipped to a restorer in Australia for some of the, the uh, engine parts and things like that, and that's what it looked like at our museum when uh, it was a little bit more airworthy. They, they uh, had to totally rebuild the wings, and it's thousands and thousands of man hours to get these things going, so it's, it's just mind-boggling to me that a few people will do this and keep working on them. And then this is, the Focke Wolf FW 190. Um, this particular model is. This was a ground attack one. They they came out in various. Oh, I bumped that. Came out in various configurations, but this one, that cowling that's along the basically the uh, the hood, if you will, underneath that is is two 50 caliber machine guns. And then on either wing, there's a 20 millimeter cannon that fire through the propellers, because the Germans loved those. They, they had the synchronization of guns mastered. And this could carry a bomb load as well. But they used a lot of these on the Eastern Front to uh, as anti-armor, anti-personnel, light armor. And I get a close up of if you look down where the where the uh, the Maltese cross is, by the left wing, you'll see a tank there. That that tank right there. So this is this was for when this was introduced to the British in 1940. They they were quite shocked because they were used to one called a BF 109 that was built by Messerschmitt, slower. Also maneuverable, but the Spitfire was the equal of that one in basically a head-to-head -head dogfight. This had incredible flight characteristics, and a lot of the it was it didn't have any hydraulic controls. There it had electric controls for the throttle, the mixture, and the flaps. So it took a lot of the workload off the pilots, so they could get busy trying to stay alive and shoot down their whatever enemy came into their sight. And this one was rebuilt in Germany from basically kind of from scratch. It was based on one that was uh, crashed, shot down in 1944 and just obliterated when it hit the ground. The restorers went to the area where it was, got a fragment of it, brought it back to the factory and it is, that fragment is in this plane. Wow. Uh, but the one thing they couldn't find was these were powered by uh, a BMW radio engine. And they're very hard to come by, so 
when you look real close at this, this has got Pratt and Whitney engine built right here in the United States. <coughs> and something I learned about the Japanese Zero was there were a number of them that before Japan and, and the U.S. were at war with one another, Pratt and Whitney had a deal with the Japanese military and probably more than a couple of planes that participated in the Pearl Harbor attack had Pratt and Whitney engines in them. Yeah, it's, it's ironic. But, you know, we got it back. We won. <coughs> neener, neener. <laughs> This this is a, a this is a drop tank for the Focke-Wulf. Drop tank is this is extra fuel because all the, the British planes, the British fighters, and the German fighters, when they were building them, they didn't worry about great distances because everything in Europe compared to the United States is fairly close. Where our fighters and especially our bombers were built to fly a thousand. 1,200 miles or more, depending on how much fuel they could carry. These were in the, like, anywhere from 250 to 450 <coughs> miles. And if they were in full war emergency power, they're burning fuel like crazy. But even, these are made out of welded aluminum. I mean, the, the fabrication for these drop tanks that is, there's a lot of craftsmanship that goes into this versus the, uh, American and British planes had drop tanks that were uh, wax impregnated cardboard that when, because they would burn fuel from the drop tanks first and if somebody spotted the enemy, the first thing they did was drop, the t switch fuel to the main tanks drop and drop the drop tanks and they probably littered Europe with them. But on here you'll see the Akhtung and what that is is instructions for a civilian in areas that were held by the Nazis that if they found this drop tank, bring it to the nearest Luftwaffe air base and they would get a reward for it. Because and I, I'm glad that the German high command thought they were military geniuses because they were idiots and they, they made some bad des decisions and they used precious material and time to build these drop tanks, so God bless them. This is the, the well, as it says, the TBM Avenger. It was TBM because this was built under contract by General Motors. And if any of you have read about the exploits of President George H.W. Bush, he, uh, against his father's wishes, he, uh, enlisted in the Navy and became a pilot of one of these and was shot down uh, bombing a radar installation on an island that was near Iwo Jima. And he was rescued by a submarine that apparently he paddled frantically away from it for about 30 minutes because he thought it was a Japanese sub. And then they, you know, they convinced him that they weren't and picked him up. But this had a crew of three this was the biggest single engine plane that the American had in, in World War II. It's a massive right engine. It's, uh, I believe this is an 18 cylinder engine. And uh, it's a crew of three. It can carry a 2,000 pound torpedo underneath it. Oh, and uh, the drip tank there, I was afraid if I used the laser pointer, I'd do something. But there, one of the things about radial engines that I've, I've learned is where inline engines, you know, they're typically a V or single cylinder or a single configuration, you know, a straight, and oil stays in the engine except when it's being burned and as, you know, an exhausted out. Radial engines, they say, if it's not dripping, there's a problem. So that's, every time these are in the hangar, they have the big drip pans underneath them to catch the oil. And when they're out on the tarmac, they're, they're dripping. So it's, it's, if you walk up to a radio engine plane and you see oil, it's okay. It means it has enough. And 
The wings were designed by Grumman. It's such an awesome design. Th these could go from that fully folded to completely open in five seconds. And once it starts, there's no safety. So anybody who has parts in there, you're, you're going to lose them because they come together fast. But for uh, storage in an aircraft carrier and getting them on the elevators and up on the deck, they had to have the folding wings. And this is uh, our the FG Corsair restoration. This one is, uh, well, let me go back. Let me go back to the, the Avenger. Because uh, this one, again, the reason why these planes survived is because they didn't go into combat. It's why we have so many warbirds now. There are very few worldwide that are in flying condition that actually saw combat. Um, the one, and many of them are mocked up as a tribute to a particular <coughs> aviator. Uh, you know, it's the same type that they flew, but not that particular plane. This one was, this was a trainer that this helped a lot of pilots get certified for carrier landings and it bounced around all over the continent of the United States and then uh, it was loaded on to uh, a carrier group in San Diego in early August of 1945 and it was going to sail out to the Philippines and then to Japan because they were getting ready for the big, the, the planned amphibious <coughs> assault and air invasion of, of mainland Japan. And this arrived in Pearl Harbor on <coughs> August 7th, 1945, the day after the first atom bomb was dropped. Wow. And so it, they got orders to head back to the States and uh, so it never went into combat. It, uh, in 1949, it was stricken from the records, from naval records, and it was sold, or declared surplus and sold. This one, actually, one of the cool things about these was because of that torpedo bay underneath, these were bought by various companies up in northern United States and Canada to be used as firefighting aircraft because they could carry a couple tons of water to be dropped on fires. And this one, along with five others, did that for about a dozen years. And actually more than that, finished its firefighting career in 1994. Yeah, that's a long career. And it was sold to a place called Vintage Wings in Washington State, then sold to a single owner who then took eight years to restore the aircraft before he sold it to the Warburg Museum in 2004. So it was a, a part of the Warburg Museum before the uh, Warburg Museum opened its doors to the public. Now we'll get to the Corsair. The FG Corsair, the Chance Bought was a company that built the Corsairs. How many of you saw Baba Black Sheep, the television series? Robert Conrad was so cool. A lot cooler than the real life Pappy Boynton. But they flew the Corsairs, the, the gold wing aircraft. The reason why those were built in that configuration is they wanted the biggest engine, engine and the biggest propeller that they could find for a fighter for the performance. So this has the, uh, or had the uh, Pratt & Whitney R2800, the same engine that powered the uh, P-47 Thunderbolt. It's a massive engine. It produces over 2,000 horsepower and could get these up to about 430 miles an hour. Not like that. <laughs> this one was in parts uh, and through I've seen there's some photographs that were not good quality that I chose not to use of when the Warburg Museum first got it. It still had that, that navy blue color to it, but it was in pieces. This is a multi-year restoration, and at the end of it, it will probably be, so there's, there's the wing root, and then behind it, you see the wing. 
wings, plural. <coughs> Every time I go into the museum, they're a little further along with this, but it is probably about five to seven years from being airworthy. And it is um, a $4 million project. And a lot of those, a lot of the money for that comes from donations <coughs> from folks like us. So there are several, you know, instead of having a, a whole assembly line of people work, working on these, there are four or five restorers who come in when they can and, and build parts, and everything has to be just right because, you know, it's an old plane. This one uh, was accepted into the Navy inventory in May of 1945, so it never saw combat again. And this was built, license built by Goodyear in Akron, Ohio which I thought was really cool that it has an Ohio connection. And it was with maintenance squadrons, it was with training squadrons for a number of years, and then it was stricken from the Navy inventory in 1955, and it was set to be scrapped and melted down. Um, in 1958, a gentleman named Ed Maloney, who was starting his Plains of Fame Museum out in Chino, California, which is now a world-famous museum, he bought it, and it was a display plane, and it sat outside along Route 66 as an advertisement for his museum, and in 73, this plane was purchased by a private owner, 1975, he, had it, he and his group of mechanics got it airworthy, and it was used in the Bob Bob Black Sheep television series. Wow. Yeah, who knew? And, and it was so, it was only 40 years old then, so, you know, it was just a young plane. Later it was purchased by an owner in Danville, Indiana, and in, I think in 06, was purchased by the Tri-State Warbird Museum, but once the Bob Bob Black Sheep series was done, this sat in a hangar from 1977, in storage from 1977 until about, 07, when it was brought to the museum, and again, it's a lots and lots of work, and they, they had to, the wing, the original wing route was completely corroded through, so this is a new build, and that is the engine. It is a massive, it's, the engine is like this big, and it's sitting, it's, that's going to be the last thing that's done, because the Engine overhaul is, I believe, $125,000 to overhaul it. Oh, a, a propeller overhaul is $35,000. Because it has the biggest, it's a 13 foot 9 inch diameter, four bladed, variable pitch propeller. And uh, they, they don't come cheap, I guess. And there are very few people that are skilled enough to work on them. And then we have Yankee Doodle. Yankee Doodle originally flew for the museum as Axis Nightmare. Um, this one, the, it, it has the distinction of, this was a movie plane. Uh, George Clooney was doing the, he, he was the, the uh, either producer, I think, no, executive producer and star of the remake of Catch-22, and learned that the Tri-State Warbird Museum had a flying B-25 because Catch-22 takes place at a U.S. Army Air Force base in Italy. And George Clooney wanted to film on location because he owns a villa not too far from there, so he could be home. <coughs> and so, uh, pilots and the restorers from the Warbird Museum flew it from Claremont County Airport to upstate New York where it refueled, then Goose Bay, Labrador where it refueled, then across the Atlantic to Greenland where it refueled, and they tell me it was really, really cold. <laughs> because there's, virg th th your heat is whatever you wear. Uh, 
and then it flew to Scotland where it refueled and it actually linked up with a group of aircraft to be able to fly it over the beaches of Normandy for the D-Day celebration and then it flew on to Italy. They had to repaint it from Axis Nightmare to Yankee Doodle and it has remained in Yankee Doodle trim ever since then because uh, aviation grade paint and the amount that they have to use is tens of thousands of dollars. So it looks awesome. And it actually, they wanted it mocked up. That When you go to the museum and you get close up to it, it the paint is worn in a way that a combat aircraft would be. Because the maintainers didn't, you know, flight crew in World War II, they wanted, they patched holes, they cleaned the inside of the planes, they made sure the engines ran and that landing gear worked, and then they were up for mission after mission after mission, and there's gentleman Mike, can you raise your hand? He shared, his, his father was a bombardier navigator on a B-25 Mitchell in World War II. He and his crew flew 70 missions. Wow. They were only required to fly 35, and as a group, they re-upped for an additional 35. And, and uh, so they flew from June of 1944 to May of 1945, and all of them came home, which is amazing. Yeah. And his father passed away the day, 40, 55 years after his, his last mission, to the day. Yeah. I've got a couple more pictures of this one, and then we have to get to Cincinnati Miss, which was on the, the slide to preview the, the presentation. So this is the Bombay. I took these pictures because no one was around. Bombay door was open. So I laid on my back on the on the hangar floor, and that that is a relatively small bomb load. But these aircraft, they B-25 was so versatile. They could be gunships. They there was a model. It started in the Pacific with one gentleman who he and his wife had owned an airline in the Philippines. When the Japanese invaded the Philippines, he made his way with partisan help to Americans and enlisted in the, the uh, U.S. Army Air Corps as an officer, and he out, started outfitting, turning the B-25s into gunships, including, after some experimentation, they took a 75 millimeter cannon, that, the same type that went in a Sherman tank, and they put it in the nose of the B-25 and took ships out with them. I, I've read it was, uh, it would slow the plane down, they'd have to, throw the throttles full forward when they fired it because it would slow it, the recoil would slow it down so much. And it was really loud. This is it in its original, when I say original, it's what it was mocked up at the Warburg Museum as Axis Nightmare. And that's flying at one of a number of events we have throughout the year. And then we have Cincinnati Miss. She's gorgeous. That is, that is a P-51D. These were original, the P-51, if you think about the, the uh, Joint Strike Fighter that the Air Force, Marine Corps, and Navy have right now, the F-35, it was in development for 21 years before it did its first operational deployment from the time of sketch, the first flight was 147 days for the, the uh, A models of the Thunderbolts because the British needed them. British didn't like them when they had them, when they first got them because they had an Allison engine that just wasn't powerful enough. And one of Roll, Rolls-Royce engineers had the idea, well, why don't we put the engine that's in the Spitfire in, the, in this little Mustang? And they did it. it, up, it horsepower by about 400 and an extra 50 miles an hour. So this is, this one, when it was in its war configuration, again it had, the pilot sat on his parachute, 
He had a half inch plate, steel plate armor behind him with a headrest bolted into it. And these had self sealing fuel tanks, 650 caliber machine guns. Um, they had a top altitude of nearly 42,000 feet. And they flew some very long missions because with drop tanks, you see the drop tank there under the left wing, they were able to, to escort all the heavy bombers, the B-17s and B-24s, all the way from bases either in Italy or North Africa or England into the heart of Germany and back and protect them from the Luftwaffe. Wow. And if you take a look there, so this was, you see the serial number, the 44 dash, Late 1944 is when this aircraft was finished, but take a look at the crew weight. That's with all his gear, the pilot could weigh no more than 200 pounds. Wow. And now this aircraft, what they did was took the, uh, there was a, a fuel tank behind the pilot and radio equipment back there, and to turn, this was converted into a two-seater by removing the armor plate, removing the uh, fuel tank, and putting a jump seat in. So at some of the events that we have, they'll have a raffle, and the winner can get a ride in one of, one of our aircraft. Uh, at the Gala fundraiser, which is in mid-June, they raffle off a ride in the, in the P-51, which would be so cool. And then this is one of our events that's coming up for the, those of you who have kids and grandkids. The, there are lots of educational events and family events that go on throughout the year at the Warburg Museum. But, yep, Santa, I'm not sure what Santa's flying in. Probably the, the expediter, the hokey pokey. And then in January, January 14th, Stephanie Feltz is our director of education and she's always got events going on if you check our website, which will pop up here in a minute. But it's uh, tristatewarbirdmuseum.org is the web address, and there are some brochures on, on the table. Yes, she pointed right, gosh, that was a Carol Merrill moment there. <laughs> pointed right at it. When did they start populating the bone yard for surplus? Oh, uh, Davis Mountain out in, in Arizona. Yeah, yeah. When did, when, when did they start that? Did we I think, era, no, I think that it may have been early Cold War, Korean War. Okay. Uh, he, what he's referring to is a place called the Boneyard. It's Davis Mountain Air Force Base in Arizona. Uh, my wife and I drove by it in 1995. It is thousands of acres, hundreds of acres of thousands of planes that are in various mothballed states. Uh, pretty much every type since the Korean War is stored there. But it, it would take, take quite a bit of effort to get any of them into, into airworthy conditions. So, I'm talking about more like spare parts. Oh, now that, yeah, they'll cannibalize the heck out of them. Because you can't find any any spare parts for these things hardly at all, probably. It's, you know, actually, I've, I've been surprised to learn that with various types of planes, especially the P-51, there is this thriving market. Uh, there's a group of uh, pilots and fabricators that built, they uh, found out about a Messerschmitt, a BF-109, that had ended up at the bottom of a lake. I saw that, I saw a picture. It, and it is the only intact, uh, they brought it up from the bottom, they had to patch all the bullet holes, and spent about 10 years putting it all back together, but they used, the only non-original parts that they used were the brakes, because apparently the brakes on the original Messerschmitts suck. <laughs> Whereas, the American aircraft did much better. So here's our web address, and our, our mission is to preserve and honor and educate. 
And when you go to the museum, it is $12 for adults, $7 for veterans, but a year membership to the museum is $35. And you become a member, an annual member, and anytime you come out, show your membership and you get to walk right in. And we have an 18 minute video that people can choose to see. And when you get out there, you can choose to self-guide, because there's plenty to see. There's more than what I described. What I showed today were the warbirds that are either flying or planning on being flown. And that wraps my, my portion up. Yes, ma'am. What are the hours? Oh, thank you. I'm so glad you, <laughs> that's my wife, by the way. That's my <laughs> uh, The hours are, our hours outside of special events are pretty limited. It's Wednesday afternoons from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. And then Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. And that young lady there sitting next to my wife has been out to the museum before, and it is, it's amazing. It really, I, I never know who I'm gonna meet out there, and there are people like Mike's father that they come out there and they've never said anything to their family about their experience. And then just being around those aircraft, it brings the stories out. And it's pretty neat. And yes, sir? Do you have any planes working, uh, that you're working on from carrier? That were carrier base? Carrier base or were flown off of carrier. The, the TBM Avenger was flown off carrier for training, but not not as a in combat, so no, we don't. They're they're looking at. We usually find out pretty far into the process what aircraft they're looking at acquiring because it's a multi-year, multi-million dollar odyssey to, to get these airplanes in the air and then to keep them going. And uh, for those who have been up in a warbird, one of the big costs is fuel. Ab gas is about ten dollars a gallon, and uh, they they try to limit the speed and the altitude and the number of hours they put on the engines because you know they're expensive and tough to come by. Any yes, sir. Where do you get on most of your financing? Private donors. There are, and some of the things that I didn't show in the museum were some of the vehicles that we have that were donated by residents of the greater Cincinnati area. So it's, a lot of it is business people. The gentleman who had the idea for the Warburg Museum is the president and CEO of, of Ohio National Financial. So his name is on the side of Tweedy, of the uh, Texan. And, and it's Admiral O'Malley because I think he is where Kentucky, you have the Kentucky Colonels, well, apparently Nebraska has admirals. <laughs> and so he is, he is an admiral. You know, it's landlocked, so of course they're going to have admirals. How, how do you work, do you work with Bryce Patton anyway? Because that, that's an expensive uh, museum. Oh, oh, that's... Uh, One of the best in the country. Uh, yes, that is, and that, yeah, Wright Pat is the, I didn't know when I was a kid, I was like, it's Wright Pat. And then I found out it's the National Museum of the United States Air Force. Yeah. But yeah. our pilots, have worked with some of the pilots of Wright Pat because there are not too many people who are certified to fly warbirds. Because it's a, especially, you know, the, the B-25 and then the TBM Avenger, that's a mult, you know, those, those are high performance and most modern day pilots train with tricycle landing gear and with the exception of the, of the B-25, these are all tail draggers, which is an additional certification. Because in all of those planes, you know, the, the cowling is so long that when they're taxiing on the ground, you watch the Mustang, they'll do an S-curve because you cannot see. When you're looking out the front windshield, you're looking at sky until, until they're getting ready to take off and they raise the tail before they get airborne. So they will... They'll do this lazy F and they'll have weather permitting, sometimes even when it's raining, 
they'll have the, the uh, canopy pulled back so they can stick their head out the sides and, and watch. Any other questions? I think we got a couple more minutes. Or we Would you do us the honor uh, drawing to split the five ticket? I will. And by the folks, thank you very much for having me.